Good evening, America. Welcome to your Thursday edition of Just the News, No Noise. I'm your host, Amanda Head, reporting to you from Los Angeles, California. And we are just one work day away from the weekend. And I know that you all have to be as excited as I am. So there has been so much going on. And we do plan to cover it all. But before we get into the drama on Capitol Hill, the southern border and overseas, I think we're going to start by diving into some of the very latest news taking place up on Capitol Hill and around our country. The wait is officially over for golf lovers. Despite some bad rain and some high winds, the 88th Masters has officially started today down in Augusta, Georgia. The four-day event will include pros like Tiger Woods, Scotty Scheffler, Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, and last year's winner, John Rahm. And don't think that this is all for fun and games. While the tradition began with an original prize pot of just $1,500 and some bragging rights back in 1934 this year, the top golfers are competing for a purse of an expected $18 million. After reading figures like that, it makes me think that I should have ditched my degree and focused on my swing. My swing, like I have a swing. Now, in some other culture and sports-related news, Pro Football Hall of Fame member, author of the very controversial book, If I Did It, Confessions of the Killer, and the one-time owner of a white Ford Bronco, O.J. Simpson, has died. In a post on O.J.'s ex account, the Simpson family announced he died yesterday after a battle with cancer. The former Buffalo Bills and San Francisco 49ers star was just 76 years old. Meanwhile, up on Capitol Hill, two major events unfolding in both the House and Senate chambers after the TikTok divestment legislation passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan support in the House. Well, it has since stalled out in the Senate, at least for now. Washington Senator Maria Cantwell criticized that the bill would force TikTok's parent company to divest ownership of the popular social media platform due to their ties with the CCP. Cantwell, she chairs the uh, Senate Commerce Committee, which would have jurisdiction over the House pass bill if Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer refers it to the committee. Now, meanwhile, before the House Judiciary Committee on the Constitution and Limited Government, two of our nation's longtime investigative reporters urged lawmakers to protect journalists from federal government efforts compelling them to disclose their sources. Former CBS reporters Catherine Herridge and Cheryl Atkinson both testified in favor of the Protect Reporters from Exploitative uh, State Spying Act, which would prohibit the federal government from compelling a journalist or telecommunications firm from disclosing protected information unless it is to prevent terrorism or imminent violence. And while Herridge was surprisingly fired from CBS months ago, she was held in civil contempt by a U.S. district court for refusing to disclose sources from a series of 2017 stories she wrote about a Chinese-American scientist who was investigated by the FBI. So she's appealing that judge's decision now. And on another note, please do not forget that Uncle Sam wants to get paid as soon as the start of next week. That's right, Monday is tax day. And while many Americans have a very hard time believing how much of their hard-earned money the federal government demands of them, the big wigs in Washington somehow still manage to spend far more than they take in. And unfortunately, the problem only seems to be getting worse. According to a bipartisan policy center analysis of U.S. Treasury data through February 2024, the government is running a cumulative def deficit of $830 billion so far just in this fiscal year. The analysis reported that revenues were $1.9 trillion through February, an increase of 7% compared to fiscal year 2023. And my first guest tonight is one of the few elected officials who is expressing any concern over this excessive spending of taxpayer dollars. He's a congressman representing the great state of Oklahoma and member of the Homeland Security Committee. Josh Burkeen joins us now. Congressman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for highlighting our fiscal issues. I got to say, I look at that figure of $830 billion and it feels like I'm already running a high, uh, a high number on my credit card account. A bunch of charges just hit it and made it even higher. And yet I'm still spending money. That seems to be the mentality in Congress, is it? Yeah, look, you, you mentioned tax, tax day. Well, there's something called Tax Freedom Day, which is when the average taxpayer can stop working for the federal government to pay off their tax liability. It's about 120 to 150 days if you count that, which is passed on to our children through debt loading. You know what it was in the early 1790s, right after this Constitution was adopted? Four days. What? We had four million oh people 
And the average federal tax liability was one dollar. Twenty five cents per day was what you, the average person made. It took them four days to pay off their tax, their federal tax burden. Now it's 100 plus days, up to 150. And uh, somewhere in there, liberty has been sacrificed for for higher taxation. Absolutely. And and you brought up a really fair point in your committee. You know, we we oftentimes pull our hair out over the excessive spending in Washington on the stupid programs, the absolutely needless, ludicrous garbage. But every once in a while, there is good legislation. But if you don't have the money to pay for it, you have to reconsider. And that was something that you raised in this committee. How do we pay for it? Yeah, I've been do doing that in Homeland Security the last couple of days. I was asking just a minute ago um, in another committee hearing when when you know we're looking at this new advancement of technology on the on the border. I wanted them to give me between uh, seismic activity comparable to uh, aerial photography or aerial video footage when people are coming across illegally. I, I ask a simple question: Which one per linear foot is the most efficient for the taxpayer? They couldn't answer the question. They're going to have to come back and give us the information. You can't answer that question. Seems like you should be armed with that information going into a hearing like that. But you, um, I, I you, you, you ought to know if you're really serious about securing our southern border. Uh huh. You, yeah, that should be basically the number one priority. Um, speaking of our southern border, uh, Joe Biden seems to be concerned about the court's reaction with respect to him taking executive action to secure the border. But I don't remember him being concerned about any type of federal court mandate with him uh, or towards him with respect to, oh, I don't know, cancellation of student debt. Why do you think at this point in time he's actually concerned at staying within the guardrails of what is constitutionally allowable? Well, look, he's, he's wordsmithing. He's been saying on the border, I need more tools. And anybody who needs a visual, pull out an ink pen and say, Mr. President, you can borrow mine, because that's the only difference between Trump era policies. And it led to a 45 year low of illegal crossing compared to today. It's not statutory change that's created this. It's what he's done by executive orders, undermining parole, what the law says, undermining what asylum is and stopping 200 mile of border wall that was allocated and appropriated by Congress. Article one, section one says all legislative powers are to be vested in Congress. He takes office, reversing what was previously as a United States senator position of in 06. You'll find him saying the reason why I support physical barriers, talking about you know the wall and other type of construction, is because of the of the drugs that flow between ports of entry. You'll find that quote from him in 06. He takes office and by his pen reverses 200 mile of border wall and says not another foot. Why? Look, it's because of of who's pulling the strings. Absolutely. Um, and I want to stay on the topic of the border, but also tie in the state of Oklahoma, because people might think, you know, Oklahoma, it's a Republican state. I'm sure that they've got everything buttoned up just right. But just recently we had on your uh, state superintendent of education, Ryan Walters, and he has been raising concern for a long time over what's called yeah. Confucius classrooms and the CCP uh, infecting America's school children. It's happening through the southern border, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, I have people ask me all the time, they, they talk about Ukraine, and I go through our spending, and I talk about this is the first year that I'm aware of in our nation's history when after mandatory spending, which is mostly encompasses Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, food stamps, interest on our debt, veteran benefits, that's the bulk of mandatory spending, then what's left is called the discretionary budget. We didn't. We spent 1.7 trillion in terms of deficit last year. Our overspend was 1.7 trillion. Our discretionary budget, where Congress determined spending, was 1.7 trillion. That means last year, as far as I know, was the first year in our nation's history where 100% of what Congress spent time voting on was 100% borrowed funds. And when people ask me about more allocation to Ukraine, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up? Because we're playing with monopoly money these days, and no one, unlike the World War II generation, where they took us to the height of 100% debt to GDP ratio, which is where we find ourselves today, the difference between the sacrificing mentality back then and today was they took it from 100% back to 23% by the 1970s. They fought the war, then they sacrificed to pay off the war they fought. We're in peacetime, and we're overspending. And there's no sacrificing mentality in this country. And we are headed towards hyperinflation, my great fear within 10 years. And so for all who want to who want to spend on Ukraine, I tell them economic security is our national security. China is looking from the outside, watching us 
And they are waiting for us to have the demise from within. There's an old African proverb, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do you no harm. There's even uh, people that have, have been in very high positions of military influence in China, written manifestos talking about how they want to take us from within. Yeah, yeah, it, it's terrifying. And you talk about monopoly money. Um, and so I want to ask you about inflation. We've got these new numbers out. Groceries are up 21 percent, but, you know, 19.4 percent and 18.6 percent as far as CPI and inflation, basically both numbers flirting with 20 percent. And I don't think that's the ceiling. Do you? Oh, no. Look, the gravity of 100 percent borrowed funds where Congress spends the, the entirety of the year debating borrowed funds. And we just had a bill on the floor that's providing more money towards sea turtles. Look, I'm sorry. <laughs> But the days of that type of insanity are over if we're going to secure the blessing of liberty for our kids, for our posterity. And you look at the votes. I mean, I, I just I look at the board and I, I, I love my colleagues, but I just want to say, have you looked at our financial situation? Do you understand we can't continue what we've done for the last 40 years to a greater level than any other time in our history? Where we look at that stuff and go, yeah, it's wasteful. Yeah, but, you know. We'll, 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 Scarlett O'Hara, we'll think about that tomorrow. You better start thinking about it today. Absolutely. Uh, so yesterday, yesterday, Wednesday, yes, uh, FISA 702, the renewal of it failed. What do you think is the fate of it going forward? Look, I, I sent to my colleagues on the Freedom Caucus this great quote. They all probably know it. And I said that and I sent it to them. But it's Benjamin Franklin saying, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little bit of safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Benjamin Franklin. Amen. And I think yep. look, on this on this uh, point, and Andy Biggs has got an amendment that I, I don't understand the consternation over Andy Biggs's amendment. Andy Biggs's amendment says, get a warrant. And if time doesn't give you the essence to, to be able to get that warrant because of extraordinary circumstances, then we'll grant you some permissibility. If you can, you know, among good dialogue with those in the NSA and FBI, say time can't wait. There's a there's a, a detonation of a bomb that'll kill tens of thousands or tens or then then there's permissibility to to deal with that. But the reality is, when you look at 2021, and the FBI went on a phishing experiment and they did a, qu a query with three million people. Then they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Next year, they had to downsize that to 200,000. That 200,000 still deserves protection under the Fourth Amendment to be secure in the person's papers, houses, and effects against unreasonable searches and, and seizures. And I love what Jim Jordan keeps reminding people. Say, well, it's just a query. Well, that's just a fanciful word for search. The Fourth Amendment is yeah. plain. For you to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, no warrants will execute upon, but upon probable cause. And Thomas Jefferson had a great quote too, Amanda. People say, well, but the Supreme Court's had this or that to say about these queries. Thomas Jefferson said, you, sir, talking to an individual, deem the, seem to think that, 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 that the jurists are the only arbitrator of constitutional questions, and that is a dangerous doctrine indeed, one that leads to the despotism of an oligarch, meaning despotism is in, in the hands of only a few, absent the control of men. Mm -hmm. That's not what we yeah. have. We have people who have a constitution in plain reading. They know what being protected against searches is about. And so this is something that we ought to be able uh, to be able to correct. And uh, Andy Biggs's amendment deserves to be on this. Absolutely. Sir, we've just got a few seconds left. Do you think that the consternation, and I'm not making any allegation, but do you think there's a chance that the consternation is possibly because the intelligence community wants to target an American citizen and then just find a way to spy on them? Look, I think it's the same rationale that they used in 2013 with the Supreme Court case took, is now taking DNA swabs. Right. And Antonin Scalia, if you look back then, he said, look, I don't care how heightened of a justification you create on this. I don't care how much good you can perform. We we the, the fourth should not be violated. Scalia was right. right. We are to be a nation of laws, John Adams said, not a nation of men. We have to abide by the rule of what the Constitution says. Or then you get enough people to say in, in their legislative body, let's change the Constitution. Otherwise, that's right. Obey That's right. the rule right. of law. That's right. A spot on, as always, Congressman Josh Burkine, thank you so much for being here.
All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back with a foreign policy expert who has advised several campaigns, including former President Donald Trump. It's 2024, and you've got to start taking care of your liver now, more than ever. Why? Because the latest data from the American Heart Association indicates that adults with fatty liver were 3.5 times more likely to have heart failure than those without. That's a pretty big number, isn't it? The American Liver Foundation says that 100 million Americans have fatty liver, which means many people are at risk. We throw everything at our livers, right? Cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, statins, cigarettes. That's why so many of us have a sluggish fatty liver that makes us gain weight and lose energy. For decades now, your liver has helped you with over 500 key functions every day. It's time now for you to help your liver. There's a solution, Liver Health Formula, an all-natural supplement which contains 11 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. You can try Liver Health Formula and receive a free bottle of nano-powdered omega-3 to keep your heart healthy. Try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash justnews. That's getliverhelp.com slash justnews. Claim your free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com slash justnews. Welcome back, everybody. There is no doubt that the Middle East is in absolute turmoil once again. And now with Germany's Lufthansa Airlines suddenly suspending flights to Tehran amid concerns of Iran's retaliatory attack on Israel, it's seeming like it's only going to get worse. But can Israel protect its people from all angles at this very point in time? Or will they have to rely on Joe Biden's elderly leadership style to help them in a time of need? Well, according to a new report out of Axios, a senior U.S. military commander in charge of the Middle East is expected to head to Israel today to coordinate around a possible attack. And lucky for us, our next guest tonight can break down the very latest as he served multiple Republican presidential candidates as their foreign policy expert on the Middle East. He even wrote a book about the history and his experiences to which you can get today. It's titled Iran. Dr. Waleed Farish joins us for this important conversation now. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you so much for inviting me. Looking forward. Me too. And I want to start with that story that I flicked at at the top, and, and it kind of revolves around the strategy side of things. You've got uh, CENTCOM commander for the Middle East, General Eric Carrilla, who is heading to Israel, and he's going to have some important conversations on how to protect uh, specifically Israel from what is sure to be something retaliatory by Iran. What, do you, what, what type of conversations do you expect them to have that will actually result in something that is protective for Israel? Well, first of all, regardless of the administration's policies, whatever that policy is, and of course, this policy I criticize for not being enough tough on the Iran regime and being tough on Israel and some Arab allies. Aside from that, technically speaking, our military and the Israeli military are bound uh, with, with a strategy which is not to allow any rogue state to have nuclear uh, arms and weapons and use them and use also ballistic missiles. So. At least there is an understanding that if the Iran regime is going to massively use one or two waves of long range missiles to hit the heartland of Israel, the United States, regardless of our politics, will be standing with Israel, will extend with whatever assets we have in the region, this kind of umbrella, this kind of dome that Israel uses with Gaza. It uses also with, you know, from Southern Lebanon and within its own borders. But if Iran's regime wants to launch its big ones, meaning the long range missiles, ballistic missiles across uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, Jordan, most likely, or Syria, maybe Lebanon, then the help of the United States is needed. Why? Because if the US won't help Israel, there will be damages in Israel. There will be many victims. It will force the Israelis to go to a higher ground. And the higher ground is called nuclear response. And that's something that we all need to avoid. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, but, and, and I feel like you are the perfect person to ask this because you know the history of Iran. You have seen regime change. You've seen the styles of different leaders in Iran. As you look at this regime in particular and the retaliation that they are most assuredly going to attempt against Israel, does it stop at Israel? Because I, I'm hearing a lot of death to America chants around the United States. And I've got to admit, I'm a little worried that we're in their crosshairs, too. We are, we have always been, actually the attacks against US targets uh, were before the attacks on Israel. Remember 1982 and 83, 
when uh, Iran-backed Hezbollah forces attacked our Marines and killed hundreds of them in Beirut and, of course, in Africa and in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. And their leadership calls America, you know, the calls for death to America. So there is an Iran regime, America as a nation, war and confrontation. There are militias, including in Lebanon with Hezbollah and mostly, most recently, the Houthis in Yemen, their slogan, you can read it everywhere, al to America, the death to America. So there's no question that the Iran-led web of militias targets America. But that's a big sa- Satan. But there is a small Satan, which is called Israel. And their priority now, all these militias, Hezbollah, Syrian militias, Iraqi uh, PMF militias, all the way down to, uh, to Yemen, they are targeting Israel. So if you ask me, how are they cooking this counter reaction? I would say... They are marrying time with capability of reactions. The more we head towards our elections, the less likely we're going to, any leader is going to wage war. We'll do some things, but that's how the Iranian leadership is thinking. So probably it's going to be more into the summer where things get hot in general and politically in America. Number two, with regard to Israel, of course, Iran is waiting the results of the battle of Gaza as long as that there is Rafah standing. That's the last enclave for Hamas. And as long as, we, what you have just said, there is a political power in America is trying to get to a ceasefire. A ceasefire means let Hamas survive. And as long as Israel is busy there, I think the Iranians will give it the time. But once that is done, what's, once Israel dismantles Hamas, everything is open. Sir, on the issue of a ceasefire. Um, I think that a ceasefire would only be a ceasefire on the part of Israel if that were ever to be something that they came to terms with. I think it would be a ceasefire in name only uh, for Hamas and, and its proxies. And I think that this past weekend was a perfect example. On Sunday, you had the IDF pulling all of their ground troops from the southern portion of the Gaza Strip. And within hours, shots fired back into Israel. It kind of seems like a microcosm of a potential ceasefire, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. The ceasefire of jihadists is linked to what they need. If they need to rearm, if they need to replenish, if they need to prepare an operation, oh, ceasefire. And then you have thousands of uneducated, uninformed, misinformed people here in the West, specifically in the United States, who are chanting on the streets, ceasefire, ceasefire. They don't know what they're talking about. This is a tactical mode by Hamas and other jihadists so that they could have you know, the upper hand on the battlefield. Uh, I was born and raised in Lebanon, and it was during the war of Lebanon. I have witnessed about 100, let's say 105 ceasefires between the various factions, including those who became the ally of the Iran regime and before them the PLO at the time. So ceasefires are not that easy, are not that well respected as in other wars. And that could be a problem for Israel and eventually not just Israel. If Hamas is left without being dismantled, their next target is going to be Egypt, Jordan. They already started in Jordan uh, a few weeks ago. They want to bring down the, the regime in Jordan, the government, and they may expand all the way to the Gulf. So a ceasefire before dismantling Hamas and finding, and that's another point, finding with the help of the Abraham Accord members an alternative to Hamas uh, in Gaza, that would be the biggest mistake of the century. Hmm. Um, Dr. Ferris, President Trump has relied on you for your wisdom with respect to Middle East policy. And uh, if if he should win the election in November, I think that a lot of things would change with respect to foreign policy. But what do you think President uh, a Trump 2.0 policy on Iran would look like? That is predictable. Not only we spoke about it in the early part, but his achievements in terms of basically withdrawing from the Iran deal. That was the most powerful decision made by the uh, Trump administration. And I believe as a historian, not as a political observer here, is one of the major reasons why he was fought with this ferocious uh, you know, pressure is because of the interest of the Iran deal. The Iran deal has to do with hundreds of billions of dollars. When he put an end to that, Look at what happened to him. The opposition, uh, both international and domestic, grown to the 100%. So he will make sure that the Iran deal is not going to go through. Second, he put the Iranian Revolutionary Guard on the terror list, something that almost nobody in the region or in the world have done, and he's done it. And that also was the second reason for why he was opposed uh, in foreign policy in the United States. But that led to one thing that nobody has achieved before. It's the Abraham Accord to have an alliance, a cooperation between Israel, the UAE, 
Bahrain and then Sudan and Morocco, and even it would have engulfed all the other countries. That's an achievement that wouldn't have been possible had he had not changed U.S. policy towards Iran. And that's a credit to him. I think that's spot on. Sir, before we let you go, tell everybody where they can find out more about your book, Iran. The, the easiest thing for all my resources, including my book, is at Walid Ferris. That's social media, of course, for the book, all the resources online, including Amazon.com. And thank you again for inviting me for this wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Dr. Ferris, you are irreplaceable, especially on these issues. And uh, unfortunately, I think that this conversation is going to continue throughout the summer. And I don't know what the resolution is going to be, but I know that we're going to rely on you for the wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sam. Thank you. Look, when Donald Trump left office, Iran had four billion dollars cash on hand. Now, as of, I think, October of last year, they've got about 70 billion. So things have changed just a little bit. And I think they need to go back. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick commercial break. But when we come back, I'm going to be speaking with the Southeastern Legal Foundation's executive director, Kimberly Herman, about the nonprofit court's case. Welcome back, everybody. When many Americans hear about DEI today, they often think about missed opportunities like job offers, promotions, college admissions or scholarship opportunities that filter candidates through the lens of gender or race. But for a group of white farmers in Texas, the discriminatory policies behind the DEI bureaucracy in D.C. is preventing them from getting much needed disaster and pandemic aid from the USDA. The federal agency is using race, gender or other socially disadvantaged traits to determine who gets financial assistance and how much. That's the claim of the farmers who have asked a federal judge to issue an emergency injunction to stop these practices on the basis that they are, duh, unconstitutional. Our next guest leads the nonprofit that is representing these farmers in court. Kimberly Herman is the executive director for the Southeastern Legal Foundation. Kimberly, great to have you back on the show. Great to be with you. I, I read something like that in my intro and I read the story about it and my jaw nearly hit the floor. It just seems so obvious that this is unconstitutional. I can't believe they even have to fight this, but thank you to you for taking up this case. Fill us in on the details. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we agree that it seems absolutely egregious. Um, several years ago, we sued the USDA on behalf of farmers for a similar program that excluded white farmers, um, and the courts very quickly issued an injunction. And so what's happening in this particular case is that we have eight programs uh, from the USDA and they're simply for disaster relief and pandemic relief, right? So in other words, you have a drought, you have a flood, um, we had the pandemic, and farmers can apply to get uh, relief from the USDA to help with their financial losses. Unfortunately, when our clients applied uh, to get this financial assistance, they were told that they are going to get less financial assistance, so less money from the federal government just because of their skin color and because of their sex. Um, and so these programs give white men less money just because of those two immutable characteristics. Um, and that is flatly unconstitutional as we all learn in grade school. Um, and so they stepped up and they filed a lawsuit. We're representing them along with Mountain State's Legal Foundation. Um, and we're looking forward to the court stopping the USDA once again. Yeah, I just had their general counsel, Will Trackman, on the show. He's he's fantastic as well. Um, so I know that these are farmers in Texas, but the USDA, that is a that's that's a federal agency. So are are other farmers being affected by this too? This affects farmers all throughout the country, right? And these programs are really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, one yeah. of the things that President Biden did when he first took office was he um, he issued an equity initiative, basically. So he issued an executive order that told every single federal agency in our country, you need to put equity, AKA what you were talking about, DEI, into every single program that you have. And the USDA, um, Secretary Vilsack, absolutely took that and he ran with it. And so there's really a whole of government approach here. And one of the things that we keep, keep saying and reminding ourselves is that disasters don't discriminate based on race or sex. 
right? The federal government cannot do so either. The Constitution prohibits it. Um, and so this is, again, it's just the tip of the iceberg, um, whether it's farmers that are having to fight back, because a lot of people tend to forget about our farmers in this country, unfortunately. And whether it's them having to fight back or whether it's our teachers in our schools, um, DEI is rampant in our country, and it's imperative that we stop it when it violates the Constitution. Absolutely. As if farmers haven't been beat down enough uh, in the last 20 years or so. I want to move on to a different subject. Speaking of uh, beat downs, hopefully this is a beat down for men and women's sports. But the NIAI, which is the National Association of Intercollegiate Sports, it represents about 239 like smaller colleges. They have banned male athletes from women's sports on the legal side of things because you are such a legal brain. Do you think that the NCAA is looking at this or at least their general counsel and thinking, ooh, we might have to do this too? I would sure hope so. Um, unfortunately, what we know that's coming from the Biden administration are going to be changes to Title IX, um, which is the statute that really it's what it's supposed to do is ensure that uh, women have equal rights in sports and that women have equal rights in education. But the Biden administration is looking to turn it on its on that that on its head, which unfortunately, I think the NCAA is going to see as a license to go ahead and to require um, that you allow men to compete in women's sports. Uh, what what we've seen this past week, I'm a, I'm a excited about, I'm encouraged about. Um, I have no doubt that when we have uh, the new Title IX laws, though, that come down, that these policies are going to be challenged by those on the left, while the majority of us are going to be challenging and filing lawsuits uh, against the new changes. Because at the end of the day, a woman is a woman and a man is a man. And Title IX is there to protect women in education and not to eviscerate them. Yep. It's only XX or XY. Those are the only two yeah. choices and you can't change them. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask you about something very special that's happening tomorrow. You are speaking at Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty's School Board Summit. Um, I can't think of anything that is more important right now with respect to parents getting involved. Tell us about this. Yeah, so um, Will and another group, Noah Webster um, Educational Foundation, are, are teaming up and they are working to train school board members throughout our country. And one of the big things that we do at Southeastern Legal Foundation is we want to train the American public on their constitutional rights. We have trained thousands and thousands of college students and thousands, uh, even more than that now, tens of thousands of parents on their parental rights. And so now we're reaching out to school board members. We have seen so many wins across this country. We have races coming up later this year. I know Moms for Liberty is very active in those races and they're just, um, you know, as people go to the ballot boxes, they're realizing they have to make change at the local level. And then those school board members need to be trained on the Constitution and how to protect the Constitution. We have gotten so used to it being adversarial, um, the relationship between parents and school boards. What One of the things that we really want to do is show school board members and parents it doesn't have to be adversarial. They all can be protecting students' rights and parent parental rights at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're speaking about tomorrow. And I'm really excited to get to reach more people. You are the perfect person for that, because since the inception of the show, we've had you on talking about the tools uh, that you have been such a you're just such a fighter for parents and education. And I think it's incredible. And we appreciate you being here tonight. And we appreciate you being on here all the times that you are. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, everybody, we are going to take a quick commercial break. But when we come back, I'm going to be speaking with Stacey Washington, host of Stacey on the Right. You have probably seen her all over social media, but we're going to be talking to her about the pushback that Donald Trump is facing over his abortion comments this week. If you remember when John and I interviewed Donald Trump last year, he had uh, a program that he was interested in starting under a Trump 2.0 presidency with regards to creating kind of a parent for. And uh, so it's an exciting thing. I think that President Trump's thoughts and policy on this is going to uh, change a little. Welcome back, everyone. Donald Trump cruised to a very comfortable primary victory in practically every single one that's happened so far in his race to become the Republican nominee for president in 2024. But he ruffled the feathers of many conservative voters this week by repudiating 
a federal abortion ban and advocating for a more moderate stance on the very contentious issue. And on Monday, the 45th president posted a video saying that the issue should be left to the states to decide. Then on Wednesday, he was asked about the Arizona Supreme Court's decision to uphold a law that will criminalize all abortions except those that are deemed necessary to save the life of the mother. Trump admitted that he thinks the law goes too far. And joining me now to discuss this polarizing issue and the potential role it will play in the 2024 elections is the host of Stacey on the Right and author of the book Eternally Cancel Proof. I love the title of that book. Stacey Washington. Stacey, thanks so much for joining me. Amanda, it's so good to be with you. And especially on this topic, um, I, I know that anyone can talk about anything. I, I don't play um, identity politics, but sometimes it is more powerful to hear women discuss an issue like this. So uh, yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah, it, it is. And I think, you know, for for us ladies talking about it, if there's someone watching who has a differing opinion from what we have, it's a little bit more palatable to hear it from another woman, because oftentimes I think they feel like if it's coming from a man that it they have a certain feeling about that. So I want to start with just what your thoughts were about President Trump's video. Well, so first of all, this isn't a moderation away from any previous Republican Party standpoint on abortion. We have always said um, that in certain instances, you have health of the mother, you have rape, and you have incest. And while we would prefer to have a pro-life perspective that is 100% of the time, never, ever having any abortions, the reality is that we take the hill that's in front of us. I, I use battle metaphors because I'm a former Air Force uh, active ser- duty service member. I shot marksman on active duty, so I really believe in that kind of imagery. It can be very inspiring and also illustrative. And so here we are. We have a huge war. We had a wartime victory. That was Dobbs. And the Democrats have mobilized against the Dobbs victory to try to take back the states one by one. And they've had seven victories. And so President Trump, in the lay of the land for 2024, is trying to take back some of that ground by moderating on the stance based on the polling, still a pro-life position, but acknowledging that we're losing ground. And if we don't make a change, we will continue to lose ground. And so for people who don't like President Trump's stance, if you're on the right and you're saying, look, I don't I don't agree with health of the mother, incest, rape, those exceptions are are really misnomers. OK, I got you. Uh, open up your wallet because Mackenzie Bezos gave Planned Parenthood $275 million. And so the pro-life movement is behind on fundraising. We're raising money hand over fist, but still not enough to counteract that money that Mackenzie Bezos donated. So donate, knock doors, talk to your friends and neighbors about why you're pro-life, share the true issues of this election, which have nothing to do with abortion, and support our nominee. The presumptive nominee is President Trump because it's between Biden and the Democrats and Trump and the Republicans. And no matter who they run, whether it's Biden or Michelle Obama or any other Democrat, the party platform remains the same. It's pro-abortion. All of their policies lead back to abortion. And worse than that, they're pro-open borders. They don't care about the Lake and Riley, the two-year-old girl in, in, in Virginia, all of these children who've been killed, all the women who've been killed, all of the migrants who are dying, 100 migrants a month die on our southern border. Think about what you're supporting. If you're saying, well, I won't vote for Trump based on this one announcement about abortion, then you're supporting sex trafficking, rape trees, and all kinds of other malfeasance, dirty, dastardly evil that's happening on the streets of America today. The choice is clear. As Christians, as moms, as women, we have to support Donald Trump as the next president for the next four years so that he can begin to right the wrongs that are happening. And then, of course, talk to people that you think would make a great president. Tell them you'll support them begin to cultivate that bench as well. If you don't like the people who ran in the primary, we need a new person to run as a Republican uh, after President Trump serves four years. Hopefully we can get him elected, begin to make changes, and then the abortion issue can be discussed outside of the light of a political contest, because that's all the, the Democrats are using this for as a way to win in 2024. Yeah, and and listen, I absolutely understand being a hardliner on life. I am that way as well. But you look at polls and only 10 percent of the country is hardline pro-choice and only 10 percent is hardline pro-life. You got 80 percent in the middle of the country. And it seems to me, Stacey, that Donald Trump is right in the center of that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He is. And the reason we know he is, Amanda, is because Nancy Pelosi came out and said, well, you can't just be a little pro-life. And I was like, Nancy, is that you? Am I going to see you at the (laughs) next (laughs) We have a big dinner coming up uh, here for pro-life. Are you going to be there, Nancy? Are you pro-life? Yeah, we got tickets for a lot like us. 
Right. I, she could sit at my table. Come on, let's, let's do this. Um, so, you know, when Nancy Pelosi's angry and on the shows spitting bullets, you've hit on something. And so what they can't mm-hmm. do is have a Donald Trump candidacy that is in any way moderate on abortion. And I don't mean moderate in the sense of you and I, you and I are hardliners, right? We believe yeah. in conception to natural death. We believe in the providential will of God, but we are not 80% of the voters. You get one vote, I get one vote. In a, in a, in a normal America, we right. get one vote each. And so, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I think they're afraid that he and his moderate stance will appeal to voters who really don't care about abortion. Amanda, they want to know how can they get their 401ks back up? How can they seal up the border, lower crime? How can they spend 25% less on groceries like they did when Trump was in office? I mean, yeah. these are real issues. Absolutely. Um, and I want, I want to ask you, especially on, on the crime scenario, because that's something that is obviously disproportionately affecting black communities in America. And President Trump went down to Atlanta, Georgia yesterday, um, which is not only predominantly black, but also unfortunately suffers from a great amount of crime. Now, he went to a Chick-fil-A, which is a little, a little bit of an oasis within Atlanta itself. <laughs> but the reception from the black community was pretty remarkable. Did it surprise you? No, I saw their faces. I saw the young woman who she said, don't listen to what they say about you. We support you. And he said, give me a hug. And she ran over. She was like, (laughs) I would tell my mom I made it. And I thought to myself, that's how I felt when I I saw him at Mar-a-Lago and I yelled his name and he came over and I was like, can can we please take a picture? It's me, Stacey Washington. He said, I remember you. I said, you do? He said, thank you for, for supporting the campaign. And he said, let's take the picture. And we snapped the picture and on my face. I've got like the glow of a woman who was just, you know, it was like a revelation <laughs> to me that he remembered who I was. And so I saw that in her. It was kindness and respect. I, th- I saw the people in that Chick-fil-A looking at him as a person. And, and he is, they've yeah. tried to demonize him and otherize him and make him into a, not a human being. And it doesn't work when you meet him in person, whether you agree with his policies or not, you realize he's just a regular guy. He's running for president, yeah. but he's a human being. He, he eats, he sleeps, he puts clothes on. He probably gets yelled at by Melania, right? He worries about his kids and his grandkids. <laughs> he's just like us, you know? Yeah, yeah. Very quickly before we go, I just wanted to get your reaction to something that Whoopi Goldberg, I guess, think lands with her audience on The View. She said Republicans want to bring back slavery. And Stacey, I'm just wondering how you can sit on the right side of the aisle with your own party wanting to bring back slavery. I know. The cattle cars are pulling up right now. After I get done talking to you, I'm going to get in there, prepare for Trump to be president, and I'll get carried away. It was my number one joke, Mm -hmm. Amanda, during his, his presidency was that I would be on the radio and I'd say, oh, do I hear the cattle cars pulling up because Trump's president and I'm still black? It's it's it doesn't resonate. She also thinks that the Ten Commandments don't uh, actually prohibit murder. She calls it the top 10 oh instead gosh. of the Ten Commandments. Wow. So, you know, she's she's not mainstream. Uh, she's on a big yeah. television show on ABC, but she's not mainstream. I think you're exactly right. Well, Stacey, I don't think you're black anymore because according to Joe Biden, unless you vote for him, you ain't black. So, you know, maybe we got to take your black card away these days. Stacey, okay. you are fantastic. I, mean, I, I love I your radio going. show. <laughs> I know you, you are. I know it. you are. Everybody, go check out her radio show. Find her on all of social media. Stacey Washington, you can find her at Stacey on the right. She's incredible. You're going to really enjoy her content. We've got to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Just hours before yesterday's House vote on reauthorizing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, better known as FISA, former President Donald Trump posted a call to kill the legislation on his Truth Social account, writing, kill FISA, it was illegally used against me and many others. Sure enough, that's exactly what the House did, with 19 Republicans helping Democrats vote down the measure. Joining me now to help me break this down uh, is Just the News senior correspondent Nicholas Ballacy. Nicholas, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. No sooner had he tweeted it or truthed it, whatever we're supposed to say, than it get done. I mean, I, I have to say, I think that it was probably heading in that direction. But how much of a nudge do you think he gave it? I think it had a big impact on where things went. I mean, the warrantless surveillance uh, amendment that was actually proposed and went through the rules committee was ready to be voted on if this uh, rule to consider the bill were to be adopted on the House floor. 
And that was really the big amendment that the conservatives, the House Freedom Caucus, and, and those who are aligned with it uh, really were pushing for. They got it in there. Uh, of course, it needed to be voted on and put through a, as an attachment to the bill or a change to the bill. But uh, yeah, I think when Trump said, you know, kill FISA, I think that really impacted the people who were not sure, the lawmakers who were maybe on the fence about where to go. I, I think that did have a huge uh, impact on how things turned out. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and if it were up to me, FISA would go away absolutely completely. I think that considering, I think it was the article that John published on Just the News, 278,000 times that it had been abused uh, against the American citizens, I think a lot of Americans feel like it probably should go away. Um, with with respect to when the renewal has to happen by, um, when, is there a date for that? So April 19th is the date when the actual current extension would expire. So they have to do something. Uh, of course, they could just let the whole thing expire, which I don't see happening, but they need to make some sort of move. And it's not clear what the House GOP leaders, like House Speaker Johnson, are what they're going to do at this stage. Uh, I'm hearing there could be some sort of clean renewal, meaning you know, the current version, which is the current law being renewed for a short period of time, maybe to give lawmakers a chance to keep negotiating. Uh, also, the Senate committee passed a version that comes to the House and then they might consider it. So the definition of clean is kind of out in the open right now, because clean could mean the bill that uh, we saw already heading to the House floor with the amendments attached. Clean could mean no amendments and just bringing that bill to the floor. Or doing some sort of sort of short-term solution uh, that just remains to be seen. What the strategy here is, but time is is ticking here. They have to make a move. Yeah, I think what would be extra clean would just be doing away with it altogether. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the timing of something because you've now got FBI Director Christopher Ray out there, very serendipitous timing, I believe, saying, "Oh, I've never seen this level of threat, threat to national security." Obviously, with the attack on uh, the Iranian. Uh, headquarters in Damascus, there are national security concerns. However, Chris Ray is out there saying it's so bad, it's so bad, hair is on fire, and I do think it's bad, but him out there saying it at the same time when FISA renewal is being considered, it's interesting, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, he has really been outspoken about the fact that he thinks FISA is necessary, specifically Section 702, for national security reasons. He's big on how a warrant process, which a lot of Republicans, a lot of conservatives want, and I should mention, a lot of Democrats want. This is one of these issues where yes. progressives, so the, the chairwoman of the, of the uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus wants this, this warrant requirement. Yep. The FBI and law enforcement at the federal level are saying, look, that would slow us down. If we have a national security concern, we want to look into somebody, we got we, the warrant slows us down. Conservatives are saying it's not going to slow you down because if you really need something quick, uh, you know, in, in the name of national security, there are some exceptions that they want to build into the bill. But, yeah, the, the law enforcement, specifically Chris Ray, uh, they're out at the forefront saying, you know, we got to get FISA uh, through the finish line and we don't want that warrant requirement in there. That's really this, the uh, hot button issue here. Heaven forbid the constitutional rights of the American people create a speed bump for what they are trying to accomplish. Um, I wanted to ask you about your articles related to the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, Biden immediately came out and just pretty much unilaterally said, we're going to pay for it. Uh, the very first thought that I had actually had nothing to do with the legislative side of things or the constitutional side of things, to be perfectly honest. I thought about the business side of things because if there was something wrong with the engine, or something wrong mechanically, shouldn't the insurer of the shipping company pay for it? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people want that to happen. The question is, would that slow down the process of, of rebuilding the actual bridge? If you talk to some a experts who are engineers and familiar with the process of, of a project like this, they say it could be five to 10 years to rebuild the entire bridge and the port and everything. So yeah, during that process, they could try to get uh, the whole accountable the companies that were involved in operating this ship. We still don't have all the details as to 
uh, how this even happened, how the, we heard some electrical issue or whatnot, but we don't, we don't know exactly what a formal yeah. investigation would, would uh, show. But look, Biden's already right. out there saying it's going to be fully paid for, but there's no estimate of cost yet, a formal estimate. Right. And a request hasn't been made to Congress. So yeah. we'll have to wait and see if that happens soon. Not that cost matters in Washington. <laughs> it's just paper, technically linen. No big deal. It doesn't matter what the dollar sign is. All right, everybody. Nicholas Fallacy, you are fantastic. We love having you on, and we're going to have you back on again soon. And that's it for us tonight. Thank you all for tuning in once again. And be sure to catch my podcast, Furthermore, with Amanda Head on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. 